Welcome to the Hopening, the place where hope is happening, with your hosts Fran Cadron and Marina Teran Manery. For more information about Fran and Marina, or to apply to be a guest on the show, please go to our website www.hopening.com. The Hopening is for informal purposes only and is based on the research of your hosts. Fran and Marina, they as well as their guests, are not responsible for any losses, damages or liabilities that may arise from this podcast, which is not intended to replace any professional medical advice or care by medical professionals you are currently utilizing. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Opening. This is the place where hope is happening, and it is our honor and privilege for episode number 125 of Opening to bring you our friend Gareth Higgins. Hello, Gareth. I'm just going to shorten that biography up a bit for you, just a bit, okay? Because there's a, you know, you've done a lot in your life. So... The reason that Gareth is my friend is because I met him in Northern Ireland when I went to my retreat. He hosted that retreat. Gareth was born in 1975 in Belfast. And those of us that lived at that time know what that would have been like. Although I was on the other side of the world, it shaped my childhood. And so growing up during the Ireland Troubles, he now lives in the U.S. half time. And he writes and speaks about the power of storytelling to shape our lives and the world and peace and making justice. He's done many things in his life, one of which is dear to my heart, which is reconciliation. He has a PhD in sociology from Queen's University in Belfast, and he has helped teach the world's first graduate level course in reconciliation studies at Trinity College in Dublin. And he's also written two books, one that we're going to talk about today, one that's, I don't know, might be backwards to you, How Not to Be Afraid, and the other is just coming out. So welcome, Gareth. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, Fran, and good to meet you, Marina, properly. I'm looking nice forward to this again. conversation. Awesome. Gareth, it's it's amazing to read through everything. And I, I Googled you as well. And I, I read a little bit about you more online. I have not been as privileged as Fran to meet you in person and to spend some time in one of your amazing retreats. That's something I should put on my bucket list. And uh, But, you know, just in the short period of time that I had a short conversation with you in preparation for this meeting, it captivated me that that growing up in Ireland during that time and how it shaped you to be where you are today and do the work that you are today. So tell our audience more about that. Um, sure. Well, I, you know, as Fran said, I was born 1975, so I'm, I'm just about to turn 50. Uh, although, you know, as soon as I say that, like that, that tells you a lot about me. It also may tell you nothing about me because you'll, you'll you know, anybody listening will put their own projections of what it means to them to be born in 1975, to be just about to turn uh, 50, because uh, as you know, my my abiding preoccupation is thinking about story and the stories we tell ourselves and asking really simple questions. They may not be the most poetic questions, but they do lead to poetry. And those questions are, um, is the story true? Uh, uh, or is it the truest version we can find? And is the way we're telling it the most helpful? way so um and because one of the first stories we hear is a story about who we are and part of who we are is when were you born <laughs> mm -hmm. and then when you tell that story it becomes a story about your age now and then what you think of that age and what other people think of that age so i'll be 50 in, in about two months from now and uh my dad was retired a year and a half older than I am now, right? And, and that, so that already begins to uh, unravel 
or or go into depths to me about gosh what do i think about because i'm not going to be retired in a year and a half i'm not sure that i'm going to be uh, that i'll retire you know i don't think about work the way that my father's generation thought about work i'm glad he got to retire when he did but i'm certainly not going to retire in 18 uh, months time i don't feel as old uh, as he seemed to me whenever he was turning 50 of course because i'm his son and um at any rate that those were some things about me biographically in terms of the sociology of my life as it were to be born in the belfast area in 1975 meant to be born into conflict and even though there were degrees of how deeply affected somebody would be by the conflict and how much direct risk there would be to uh, an individual depending on where you lived or on other people's perceptions uh, of uh, of you, and perhaps maybe what your family members uh, did for a living, or uh, how they pursued their political aspirations. Um, even if you were fairly sheltered from what we called the troubles in Northern Ireland, you were still born into it. You were still born into a society at war with itself, and a society in which the dominant story was we are in conflict with each other. It is a risky place to live. There are terrible things happening. And one side is right and the other side is wrong. And we're on the right side. And you are part of the we. And the we is only us, not them. Or you might have been born into a household and a, and a community that was actively involved in peace building and reconciliation which itself created its own sense of outsider status, which was like, I believe there is no us versus them, but the problem is that there's a lot of people out there who who believe that there is an us and them, and uh, it's hard to talk about that without saying they are making our lives more difficult <laughs> because they don't believe that there's no that there, that there's no us versus them. They really believe in them, and here I am calling them they. Well while we're at it. So you could see the kind of complexity of that. And I kind of grew up in a household where the threat of the conflict, the threat of violence and the, and the torment, the psychological torment was ever present in our, in our household. My parents did everything they could to reduce its impact on me and my siblings, but it was there. And I knew that my parents were, uh, uh, I, I knew the terrible things that happened. I knew that terrible things had happened to people my parents loved, and I knew that terrible things were 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 potentially going to happen. But like a lot of people who grew up in the society I grew up in, you were sort of able to put that aside as a child in some ways. You know, uh, there's a there's a comedian here in Belfast who I heard on an interview a few years ago talking about how when I think he was 16 years old, somebody threw a, pe a petrol bomb or a Molotov cocktail onto the ground floor of their house. And he and his family had to jump out of the, the first floor window to, to escape. And then later in the interview, he said, you know, I had an idyllic childhood, uh, uh, to which the, the host, who also grew up in, in the north of Ireland, the host responded by saying, apart from the attempted murder, and and the community was like, yeah. Other than the attempted murder, I had an idyllic childhood. And I think anybody who who's grown up in conflict societies probably identifies with with that. That you you get you, you know, for the most part, unless you are you're unless you know you're living through the horror of an immediate bereavement or being physically injured yourself, you sort of compartmentalize these things. And I feel uh, lucky and grateful that I grew up around people who wanted to transcend us versus them. And as I got into my teenage years and my early 20s, I kind of fell into I, I fell under the influence of a, a rogue, a rogue band of peacemakers who and I use that phrase, you know, partly humorously, but partly also. Like they were exciting. They were rebels. They were, they were, they were that in a, in a society in which the word rebel actually has, has either heroic connotations on one side of the community or negative connotations on the other side. This was a kind of a nonviolent creative rebellion against the idea that we could only, we could only expect more conflict, that we could never truly have peace and we could certainly never come up with a path forward in which everybody would get some of what they wanted rather than just one group getting everything they wanted and the other group getting nothing. 
So I'm very grateful to have fallen in among um, peacemakers, often from a Christian church background, um, uh, sociologists. I had a great mentor professor who taught me that the the academic discipline of sociology could be almost rebellious and exciting because really all that sociology is is the study of of how and why people do things and if people are doing things that are harmful to themselves or others it'd be great to understand why we do that Mm -hmm. because maybe we can find a better way to meet the same need or uh uh, uh, or didn't even determine if it's a a legitimate uh, uh uh, need uh, to me that's that's actually a very poetic way of thinking about the world and uh, and I'll and I'll sort of I'll draw this part to a close now by by naming the very thing that I'm doing is I've inherited a storytelling tradition a lot, a lot of Irish culture has a lot of uh, you know it loves words sometimes concisely more often than not we use many many more words than we need to because it just sounds better <laughs> that way so. Um, that's a bit about my my background. I, I'm quickly going to, before Fran asks a question, I, it's kind of funny because my husband had his DNA done and he oh, has yeah, a yeah, lot yeah. of Irish as well as um, Scottish right? in him. And I'm like, he really likes his words as well. So I'm like, okay, now I know why. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, that's yeah. a good way to put it. <laughs> likes your words. I've not ever heard it. I've never heard of it referred to like that. Um, yeah. You uh, you talk about in the book how you um, grew up um, with a mixed, like you were a mixed bag girl, like <laughs> just because of your DNA as well. Like, you know, sure. not um, just can you just tell us a little bit about how you grew up? Not well, really fitting in. Either. Sure. Well, the, there's there's at least sort of I'd say there's at least four ways in which that was the case. And um, <clears throat> uh, what one is to do with. I'll, I'll do the, 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 the ones that are maybe less obvious first, uh, uh, and, and that would be. In, in Ireland, in the north of Ireland and Northern Ireland, there you go, three different terms to describe different parts of the same thing. Um, you know, we don't even agree on what the place is called. So I, I typically say uh, the north of Ireland or, or even more so, I'll say Northern Ireland, if I'm, but if I'm spelling it out, I'll spell it with a lowercase n mm-hmm. as a way of trying to say this is something that nobody agrees on. And so I don't want to identify strongly with the idea of one tribalist way of seeing uh, things. Um, my family background is 50% um, Indigenous Irish Catholic background generally. Uh, and uh, the other side would be 50% uh, British, English, Scottish. And that's from my grandparents' generation on on, on both sides. Uh, and uh, And then if you go back one generation further, my mother's grandmother is actually uh, 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 Jewish from Poland and escaped Poland, I, th- I think, in probably in the 1890s. Um, and uh, presumably, we don't know all the details, but presumably left Poland for safety reasons because of anti-Semitic attacks. Uh, now, she was only two years old, so she didn't do that by herself. Her family went, they, they moved to England and converted to Catholicism. And I believe they sort of suppressed their Jewishness mm-hmm. for say again, for safety reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so I have this, this kind of half and half British, Irish, Protestant, Catholic piece uh, to me. Uh, the second piece is that I'm, um, you know, I'm a member of the LGBTQ community I identify as, as, as bisexual. I'm married to a man and um, uh, <clears throat> the, or someone who, who you know, my, my my spouse's perception of their own gender identity is more expansive than can be contained by the word man. And mm-hmm. I do think one of the things that's extremely important for us to be talking about in this world right now is um, uh, why be afraid of the concept of gender? Why be afraid of the concept of diversity within gender what what what's wrong with the idea that gender might just be a story and that the the way we should evaluate it is what does the story lead to and if it leads to more life and if it leads to more expanding of the circle of belonging more health and well-being why are some people so afraid of it 
And um, why do some people feel like they're going to lose something if other people identify in a more expansive way? You know, uh, I, I, uh, that, and that's a that's a deep conversation to be to be had. But at any rate, I I would be perceived um, by anybody who doesn't know me just by looking at me and my spouse. Oh, they're two gay men, right? Uh, and uh, I happen to identify as bisexual, which is it's not something that I really enjoy talking about because at one level it's a very private or personal thing um there's things in your life that you don't really want to talk about on a podcast but the reason i do it is because people are still uh targeted diminished mocked dehumanized and worse uh, because of other people's prejudice regarding sexual orientation and um so i say it because nobody said it to me when i was a kid mm -hmm. nobody said it to me when i was a teenager i didn't have uh, any positive language around gay or bisexual um, in the context in which I uh, was living. It was a very homophobic uh, culture, uh, both politically and religiously. And um, I think it's really important that people speak uh, so that other folks can know they're not alone and that we normalize these things, you know, anything that expands a circle of belonging and love should be celebrated. Uh, so that was another place in which I had a sort of an outsider, don't really belong uh, piece. And, and then the other two pieces which are connected to each other was, I guess, in the formation of my understanding of masculinity, what it means to be a man. Um, I definitely felt like an outsider because I, I wasn't into sports. Um, mm -hmm. I was into to movies. And um, uh, there was definitely a stigma around if you're not into sports, you're not really a man. Um, and so then the last piece would be my love of art, story, literature, music, uh, but particularly movies also sort of went along with my yearning for making peace, for being involved in reconciliation and for feeling feeling like visceral pain when I would hear horrifying news stories about something terrible that somebody had done to somebody else, particularly if it was motivated by, by politics or what we call politics. Um, and um, especially when I would see the underdog being trampled on, you know, funnily enough to use this, this, the sports world again I always used to love it I would watch Wimbledon tennis once a year I'm not really that interested in tennis but I would watch it because I would love to see when the underdog would win you know yeah. that sometimes yeah. somebody came from nowhere and they would get to the quarterfinals and everybody would root for the even their opponent would sometimes root for them because everybody wants to see a vulnerable person succeed you know yeah. um and um, so I think that, that that was another place where I had this outsider status when I when I was younger and I would go to peace building conferences and things like that. I would almost always be the only person in the room under 30, sometimes the only person under 40. And now I'm going to be 50 and I go to these meetings and I meet the person who's the only person under 30, and the only two, the two people under 40. And I think I think wistfully like, OK, good for you. Good for you. Yeah. You know. And that's not to say that younger people aren't interested in these kinds of things. I just, I tend to think younger people don't tend to go to conferences about peace building that are led by older people. I think they're, they're often doing their peace building work in, in other ways. So I've, I've grown to accept and appreciate and really value the sense of being an outsider, partly because I recognize everybody whether it's on the surface or hidden deep down, everybody has some sense of the outsider status. And that's one of the places where we can really see each other. I think we would reduce a lot of the aggression and violence in the world if we could really reach into the part where a person feels exiled and tell them that they don't have to be as alone in that exile as they feel. Wow. Gareth, there's, there's so many things that is touching me so deeply mm -hmm. in what you said. I started to make notes and then I got so captivated by you that I, I forgot to do that in the later part. But do you um, know, I think Marina, often often I want to take notes on myself because I'm so <laughs> captivating. I 
I hope listeners know no, I'm no. joking. You're you're a very kind and encouraging person. <laughs> <laughs> That's very sweet. Oh, but this, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking so much of the stories that is being told today, and I mean the the division, the us versus them, yeah. and whether you talk religion whether you talk democrats republican that's very yeah. fresh right now whether you talk lgbtq versus mm -hmm. heterosexual whatever mm -hmm. it is today it's it's those stories yeah. so to me it's the i'm, I'm very heart centered so to me it's just mm. love i just want to <laughs> love everybody and but how do you how do you pull that all together? How do we bridge that gap to not go from us to them uh, and us and them and back and forth? How do we just become we? And can you say that last part again? And just just become. How do we just become we? How do we, yeah? Well, you know, it's not. Um, it's not something that anybody can expect any of us to do overnight or even to achieve in our entire in our in our whole lifetime and i'm not sure that thinking about it in terms of achievement is the right what the right starting point i do think that there are practical specific steps we can take that can lead us to a better place or lead us to a worse place but i think fundamentally if we believe that we are alone and have to do things by ourselves alone then we will not actually arrive at the place of kind of increasing union among human beings um, because that notion is rooted in part of the problem to begin with. And that is the notion of the separate self that even if I have the motivation of a heroic figure who wants to bring peace, world peace, you know, or, or save the whales if I try to do that all by myself, first of all, I'm not going to achieve that. Secondly, I will probably mistreat other people along the way because I will say it's more important to save the whales than it is to be kind to to you or to, and the and that's just the history of social movements, you know. That, um, uh, however, if we accept or experiment with the story that there is a much bigger backdrop to our lives than our culture teaches us. And I use two analogies uh, to, to this that may, may be factual, um, but I, I think they're certainly poetically true. There's the religious belief that we're made in the image of God, you know, and a lot of people have that belief. Few people seem to embody it. Few people seem to, true, true, few people seem to be kind of learning the process of really fully waking up to, I am made in the image of a divine being that is um, entirely love. Like, you, 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 what would you do with your day if you truly believed that, right? you know? Um, as, as a friend says to me, whenever I'm, whenever I'm negative about myself or slip into low self-esteem my friend will say stop treating my friend like that because in that moment he's yeah. showing me more yeah. love than i'm able yeah. to show myself so that's the kind of religious uh, uh analogy we're made in the image of god but there's there's another story that you don't need to have any religious belief in order to accept and that's that we are made from the dust of stars that have existed for millions of years right and that every atom, every molecule in your body comes from the stars. And Joni Mitchell actually did this, this <laughs> gorgeous way of fusing. I don't know if she was consciously intending this. Um, she actually fused both of the ideas by saying we're stardust, we are golden, and we've got yeah. to get back to the garden. Now, the garden is a religious story, right? Yeah. Um, and the stardust happens to be true according to the laws of physics, <laughs> yeah. right? You could be absolutely um, the, the antithesis of religious believer and still believe that the human being is magnificent, right? Yeah. That the human being is magnificent and extraordinary and that almost none of us, maybe none of us, have gotten close to fully embodying that. Now, my view would be if you happen to be 
um, to find it life giving to 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 connect with the unfolding of an enlightened religious tradition, and that's to me any religious tradition that is uh, leaning toward devotion to love, right, rather than devotion to dogma, separatism, um, coercion, the shadow side of religion. Um, so if if you happen to to kind of feel drawn to to a love based religious uh, uh, tradition. Uh, and you also can accept the t the the findings of what we call science, right? And you know, part of the root of the word of the meaning of the word science is just knowledge. I don't think we should separate, you know, one form of knowledge from another. Like po like poetry, religion, and science are just forms of they're all forms of knowledge, and they they don't actually contradict each other at their core. So, can you imagine what kind of life you would have? If you were allowing yourself to be filled by the experience of I'm made in the image of a divine being, I am made from stardust, and so are you, and so is everybody that I uh, meet. Now, how we talk about it is is different. People might think I'm being unrealistic, and to which I'd say, well, actually, I think it's I think it's a lack of realism to repudiate, deny, or diminish these truths about herself. I mean, what can be more realistic than I'm made from stardust? Why shouldn't we talk about that in our political negotiations? Why shouldn't we talk about that in our political campaigning? You know, and there, there's a there's an answer to that question, which is that people aren't ready for it. Uh, to which I'd say it's because they haven't been trained, their appetites haven't been nurtured. Uh, we, we know that, you know, if you only ever eat junk food, you have a taste for junk food. And we know that that if we if we provide people with the best food, they will like it. <laughs> they will like it. They'll be surprised by it, you know, and that we we can increase our palate there. I've completely forgotten what oh the, the question was around how do we move beyond us versus them? I think one step is to to recognize this is not something for me to achieve by myself. It's not something that's going to be achieved in my lifetime. I'm not even sure it's something to be achieved. I think it's something that actually already exists because all my fellow human beings are also made in the image of God or made from stardust or both. What needs to be done about it is more people need to say so. More people need to 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 speak this out into being. More people need to write about it. More people need to act like it's true no matter what the response of others might be at the other end of the continuum is there are clearly people who are called to do what we call reconciliation and peace building work and to be on the front lines of that but that's not everybody you know like there were people in the north of ireland who who went and had secret meetings with people who might might have posed them a direct violent threat and that helped build a, a foundation for the peace process but that wasn't Everybody that did that, that was a small number of people. What most people are invited to do is to live like the values of peace building are true in your daily, ordinary life. I'll give you a, a, an immediate example. Last night, I'm in Belfast, and I happen to be watching the TV news, which I almost never watch. And there was a racially motivated uh, attack on a on a family. Someone threw a brick through somebody's window the night before last, um, and um, I was so impressed and and grateful that a local resident who's a white person and who's someone who would be perceived as coming from the neighborhood, you know, mm -hmm. often there can be this this thing that can happen that you know, uh, folks come from overseas or from elsewhere, they move into a neighborhood and then there's a backlash from a small number of people. Um, uh, this local woman went on camera and said, the people who did this do not represent the people who live in this community. We actually know who it was. It's probably teenage boys, you know, and, um, uh, it should, and it should stop. The folk who live in that house are welcome here, right? And like that to me, that is grassroots peace building, you know, because of, often what you would get would be you might get a local a local councillor saying this doesn't represent the local community, but it would almost be like they were denying that the attack had happened, you know, because this doesn't get done by people from around here, then it isn't real. Um, it's better if someone from the local community says 
I live in the local community and I reject this behavior and we want to welcome these people. Um, but even that is a bit more dramatic than what happens in most everyday life and encounter. And I think we can summarize that with uh, two phrases that can be operative no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what power you have or lack. And it's really about power and lack. And that is part of the journey of emotional maturing and the journey toward us rather than us versus them is to ask myself throughout my life and maybe have some big moments periodically in my life where I really go deep on this question. What are the resources that I have? And when people talk about privilege, that's really what they're talking about. You know, this word privilege, again, it's become a jargon word that some people find alienating. So, okay, you don't want to use the word privilege. Just talk about what are the things I have, um, whether I believe I earned them or not. Some of them are tangible, things like money, maybe a house. Um, uh, some of them are less tangible, maybe reputation, or maybe there's things I inherited. Um, what do I have? And how can I use these things to serve the common good, starting with the most vulnerable, the most needy uh, people first? And the other question is, what do I lack? What do I lack that would that would enhance my life, starting with the four things necessary for life, food, water, air, uh, and shelter? And I think we need to expand the definition of shelter beyond four walls and a roof, or maybe you live in a yurt that has uh, that uh, that has one round wall and a and a roof. Um, we need to expand the definition of shelter to include relationships and a sense of well-being, community, and purpose. And if we could learn to talk about these things, I like if it could almost be when you ask someone how you doing that the response could be, um, I, I've noticed I have some more things this week that I'm able to share with, with others. And I'm noticing this lack in my life. Do you know someone who can help me with that? You know, this, this actually is not naive. It's just something we don't talk about in um, what you might call like hard-nosed political or, or media discourse, to which my response would be, there's a cellist whose name escapes me, unfortunately, but uh, Tommy Sands, the, the Irish folk musician, told me this story, and he's got a personal friendship with this cellist who was uh, living in Sarajevo during the siege of Sarajevo. And he took his cello out onto the street and he started playing and while there were bombs falling. And um, somebody asked him, why are you playing your cello when the city is being bombed? And he said, you should ask them, why are they bombing the city when I'm playing my cello, right? And sometimes the most important things are not, quote unquote, realistic in the sense that the textbooks say. They're actually poetic, but by being enacted, they become realistic. I live in a society where we have we have a, a, a what we call a first minister and a deputy first minister, basically the prime minister of of the nation known as Northern Ireland, and they're both women. And twenty five years ago, that 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 was not realistic, not understood to be realistic. But even more so, the fact that one of, one of them would be an Irish Republican, uh, and one of them would be a pro British unionist and that they would behave toward each other in public in friendly ways that that was definitely it, it was about as far from realism as you could get but people and, and it wasn't i don't know it wasn't a technical language that got us there it was poetic language it was people like Seamus Heaney saying hope and history at rhyme. It was people like Michael Longley, another one of our great poets, using the Iliad 
uh, as as an example of what people can do with each other in the aftermath of war, which is to sit down, embrace each other and weep over the suffering and then have a meal together, you know? Um, so, yeah, the us versus them thing is not my problem to solve by myself. You shouldn't put yourself in harm's way unless you're truly called to it and um, you take advice from wise people who've done that kind of thing before. And it's not always about going and meeting with your you know, political opponents and trying to persuade them otherwise. A lot of it is about you letting yourself fully embody what you really are as a human being, mm -hmm. which is not a separate self, potentially productive individualistic economic unit. That's not what you are. What you are is made in the image of love from stardust. And your job is to experience that and share that with others. Beautiful. Wow. You said so many things in there, Gareth. You know, like, we are not in this alone, right? Even though this is what I believe, I believe what you believe in that sense. And sometimes it does feel like it. I'm swimming against the current, right? And... um you just you sometimes you just feel like being up because how can I make any headway here? It's just mm -hmm. it's like hitting my head against a wall, hitting my head mm -hmm. against a wall. But yeah, you know, it's of my story that I'm telling myself as well, right? Maybe my story that I'm telling myself is this this is I'm hitting my head against the wall because is it helpful and is it the truest version of the story? So going back to what you said originally, how helpful is it for me to say, why is it that I'm the only one who thinks this way? Yeah. And how true is that? Yeah. So, yeah, because, I mean, mm. all three of us are, are on the same page that we do believe um, we are made in the image of love and that we are here for a purpose. We are here in this moment, not randomly. Uh, yet we're made in the stardust. We're made from stardust, but it is not random. It is, we are here for a reason, a purpose. We're a ripple effect. And um, the stuff that you've been doing and the, stuff, the things that Marina and I have been doing, I would never have put myself here even five years ago. Right, Marina? Even five years ago. So the journey, it's the journey, right, Gareth? So uh, you you have your PhD in sociology, which is a cool way of studying people and their behaviors. And like you said before, it's uh, you get paid to study people and your, their behaviors, and it's super <laughs> interesting. Marina and I get paid for sort of doing the same thing, you know, in our work as well. And um because we do hypnotherapy as well, we understand at the bottom mm. core that all humans have the same. We're all flawed in a way that's the same, or we feel mm -hmm. that we're, we feel that we are. We feel that we're this isolated, nobody in the world has ever had this experience like I have, that, or that feels the way, or that, uh, you know, that I'm... So, I messed up. I'll never belong. All that stuff, and yet, holy! You, 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 after you hypnotize a few hundred people, you realize, wow, there's commonalities in everyone. Mm. So, in your book, "How Not to Be Afraid," as soon as I saw that title, and I show, I showed that book to my daughter. She's like, "Mom, how can I get that book? What does it talk about in that book? What, what's it about?" So, there, you've got. I think it's seven ways, right? seven ways of how not to be afraid and then what's the story that we're telling ourselves so you've got helpful hints and actually it it uh it turns our struggle it finds the truth inside our struggle mm -hmm. the truth is the, the answer is inside the struggle mm -hmm. it's inside the vulnerability so can you tell us a bit about those ways of how not to be afraid especially yeah. now yeah Thank you for asking that. Like, so, you know, the, the book is called How Not To Be Afraid. 
Um, and in much the same way as when people say what not to wear, they, they what they really mean is what to wear. <laughs> and um, so how not to be afraid could also be called how to be afraid in a healthy way, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, there's an ancient teaching that says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. But that doesn't mean that God is like some kind of wrathful being with lightning bolts about to throw them into you and, and destroy you. It's more like respect reality. Um, so an, an example I always use is put on your seatbelt. It's that's wisdom, you know, that's wisdom. It's not that that's not paranoia. Don't if you're walking near the cliffs of Moher in Ireland, don't walk too close to the edge of the cliff. Yeah, it's possible you might be blown off. You know, I have a friend 30 years ago was blown off a cliff and did die. And it wasn't, I, I, I don't mean to suggest he was being silly or whatever, but like, that's not, it's not paranoia to say, like, um, there's certain parts of town you might not want to walk in alone at night. You know, mm -hmm. that's not paranoia. Now, it can become paranoia if we distort stories of painful things that have happened mm -hmm. to people and we make it feel like everything's bad all the time or there's a monster on every corner, you know? Um, and again, back to the question of what do I have and how do I bring it to serve people? Some of us are safer walking alone at night than others. You know, and some of us may need to, if we have to walk at night, it, it'd be good to have an ally with us. So, but these, again, it's not rocket science. You can just ask and you shouldn't have to ask. What What really should be happening is that if we are all evaluating our own privileges and lack that those of us who are safe people to walk with at night would already be volunteering to do it <laughs> you know nobody would need to ask for that help like mm -hmm. um uh, and i hope each of us from time to time have the experience of somebody preemptively offering to support us with something you know i i have sometimes had a text message from a friend saying hey i saw that item on the news about about a um you know an, an unexpected act of mass violence for instance and um sometimes i would feel particularly triggered by by that because of things that i grew up with in in the north of ireland knowing about and one or one or two occasions someone will text me say hey, i saw that in the news just want you to know i'm thinking of you and if you if you need to chat and just to know oh there's someone who cares enough to understand what what might be particularly difficult for me or, you know, if it's the anniversary of a, of a, of a bereavement or of a painful event in your life, do you have a friend that reaches out and says, I'm thinking about you on this particular day, you know? Um, so, so to the question of like, what fear is actually for, like fear is supposed to keep us safe when it's, when it's in a healthy place, it's supposed to, to be a signal to us to say, Okay, I should put my seatbelt on, not walk too close to the end of that cliff, or I'm not sure about this street. Maybe I'll ask someone who knows this street, for instance. Now, there's there are fears that are then to do with the behavior of other people, right? And I do not want to sugarcoat that there are people who want to bully and hurt and scare, exile, and in some cases, rare cases, exterminate other people. Now, this is... This has been going on since the beginning of human of human experience. There's less of it than there used to be. We know more about how to reduce conflict than we've ever done. We know more uh, about how to build bridges with an expanding circle of people um, than we've ever done. And um, we shouldn't get that out of proportion. But if you are the person who currently feels targeted and you're listening to this, I don't want anything that I say to suggest that I'm sugarcoating your experience or that I'm speaking for you, you know, only speaking for me and what I've learned. Um, um, and having said that, I actually think that the greatest wisdom about fear has come from the people who have suffered the most monumental torment. Um, the great spiritual wisdom teachers of the, of the past 6,000 years, many of them are people who went through hell. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus is, is an obvious one. Um, many of the saints, many people, many, many figures from other religious traditions, um, you know, Gandhi, who was assassinated, Martin Luther King, who was assassinated, Nelson Mandela, who was in prison for 27 years, Harvey Milk, who was assassinated. Um, um, Harriet Tubman, who did not have an easy life, 
you know, um, and uh, and Viktor Frankl, who wrote *Man's Search for Meaning*, which you know, I, I know some people would critique that book, but the distilled wisdom in that book is: it's not what happens to you, but how you think about what happens to you. And we need to get really complex about that and say he's not saying put on rose-colored glasses and pretend that this pain isn't real. What he's saying is don't let other people decide for you what you're supposed to think about it. You decide who you are in relation to this thing, right? And um, one of the practices around addressing fear that we have in the book is around making peace with your own inevitable death. You know, and not in a morbid way, not in a depressing way. It might be depressing the first time you really encounter it and maybe for a period of time as you really confront it. But eventually the point is to to have peace with the fact that at some point I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. At some point all three of us are going to die. Mm -hmm. And you have no control over when that's going to happen. You know, even even if you lead the kind of physically and mentally healthiest life you can possibly imagine. You can't control the unexpected. Um, so can you make peace with that and then live in the light of that so that if somebody else threatens you, it's mm -hmm. less bothersome to your soul. Mm -hmm. That does not mean that you don't make decisions to, to take care of yourself or to ask for help when you need it. And in some cases, it may mean that you need to leave where you are and get to a safer place. But I think I'm speaking about the part of each of us that can't leave, you know, or for whom leaving isn't an option. You know, there's a piece that's it's been popular, and I understand why, for people to say in the run-up to the U.S. presidential election that if Trump gets re-elected, I'm leaving the country, you know. So first of all, it tends to be only rich people who say that. Because nobody else has a what what by what pathway would anybody else leave? You know, like unless you get a job in another country, there's not a lot. There's not a lot of places that are taking U.S. American refugees at at the, <laughs> at the, at the moment. Um, although I I could say you could make a case that there are there are some folks in 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 the U.S. that feel so unsafe right now that if a really enlightened country was to say, we're going to have visas for people who feel under threat at the moment, you know, that that's, that wouldn't be unreasonable. What would be better would be if the folks who live near them and love them and who are not targeted and not at risk would step up both by offering shelter to people who need the shelter and by taking responsibility to challenge the people who have voted for the candidate mm -hmm. that is frightening them. You know, I am having to wrestle with the fact that um, I have a couple of friends who, who, who voted for, uh, for, who voted for Donald Trump and they did it for sincere reasons. They believe that he's going to do the right thing. And they also don't believe that he's going to, that he's going to hurt people. They don't, they're not thinking about that. And, it's not always easy to, to to kind of work things through logically with these friends, but at least in the place where I'm not targeted, I want to be able to talk to these people and say, I want to let you know about how this is impacting people that I care about. And I'd like you to tell me, did you, you know, are you thinking about them? Um, are you willing to talk to the people you might have influence over about them? Um, and I, you know, I don't know, what that can lead to, but it does seem to me that one of the big mistakes of the last nine years in US politics, and it's not just in the US, has been the absence of outreach on the part of people who uh, would be traditionally called progressives, the absence of outreach from progressives to people who are voting differently to at least try to engage a conversation or try, better still, offer policies that can speak to the heart and gut of folk who are voting for other candidates in their campaign. And I just don't understand why. And maybe I'm programmed to think like this because I grew up in a society where we fought and fought and fought and fought and fought against, 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 against each other. And then we decided to collaborate. And that doesn't mean that all the parties have the same policies, but they recognize here in this society that you do need to appeal to some of the people who don't like you in order to get elected. And 
And even more importantly than that, in order to build a stable society, you can't write off half the country. You just can't. Um, so same to the people who are saying, I want to leave. I understand the fear and the exhaustion that makes people want to leave. I really want those privileged people who say that to validate their own, their own fear and sadness, absolutely, and then to use the resources they have to build a better place and to look after the people who might actually need to leave because they're not safe or they don't feel safe and that doesn't mean we have to like create you know gated communities for for people scared of trump I, it it means if you're a poet write write poetry that 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 can express the truth of our pain and our fear but also the hope of being alive make movies in which we don't just kill the bad guy but we might find ways to understand the bad guy and better still to understand and validate the needs of the vulnerable people that the bad guy is 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 targeting write music and songs that help people deal with the most the most important thing as i understand it for the future of humanity something that carl jung said and that is the future of humanity depends on how many people are able to hold the tension of opposites mm -hmm. which is to transcend us versus them mm -hmm. right and if you think that what I'm saying is you should just roll over and pretend that there isn't suffering going on, I don't, I'm either not articulating myself very well, or it's possible that your own immediate pain right now is getting in the way of hearing what I'm really saying. You know, um, to me, there's a season for everything. There is a season for grieving. There is a season for feeling rage. There's a season for feeling, for feeling fear and concern. There's a season for celebrating. There's a season for connection. There's a season for like leaning into purpose. I just have a sense that like they're all the same season at the same time. Usually, you know, we just every now and again, the, the kind of the monitor blips more in one direction and we got to focus the immediate thing in front of us. But the only way we're going to get through um, uh, a period of time in which there's so much bombardment of bad news is to make our own good news by leaning into the things that we already know are true which is that we're going to die. <laughs> so let's live now as fully as we can, asking ourselves, what can I bring to the table and what do I need to ask for? Oh, this, my goodness, you, you are really speaking to my heart and my belief. And uh, what is going through my mind is that I've learned that there are really two major concepts in life. The mm -hmm. one is fear, and the other one is love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the only way to get rid of fear is with love. Mm -hmm. And if mm -hmm. you think of, of what happened in the U.S. yesterday, um, it's all I want to do is, is I want to love. Mm -hmm. And I, I firmly believe if, I mean, you, you live halfway in the U USA. We yeah. live just above it. We're quite influenced by it. It's like they say if... Um, if the USA sneezes, Canada gets Canada a cold. Gets a cold. <laughs> so it's yeah. uh, it's literally what's happening here. And but my feeling is, instead of of going to that fear based, oh my gosh, what's going to happen with our country now? Let's run away. It's and predicting and out of fear, predicting the worst outcome. Why not send that man love, mm -hmm. even if it goes against every grain of your belief because isn't it the love the image of god that we are created in that will change the world even if it goes against everything we believe in everything he stands for but it comes from us if we as a collective world eight billion of us start to send him love nobody nobody will harm anybody anymore mm. that's my belief I, and maybe I, i'm I, crazy I, no, I can imagine that's true. And I also think that let's start with sending the love and practically embodying the love to the people nearest to us who feel most vulnerable mm -hmm. right now mm -hmm. and send the love to the vulnerable part 
of him. I don't think that Donald Trump, the man, is all that interested in my love. Like I don't, I don't, I don't think he's, I don't think he's sitting at home waiting no, for. No, but Gareth it's that say, energy. It's that well, energy. Well, and, and and I think that's right. That 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 to live to live in the world as stardust, you know, to take ourselves seriously enough to send ourselves love. And then to have a posture of love toward everybody else. Recognize that that love is not, Henry Cohen says love is not a victory march, which I, I understand. I mean, it's not about defeating other people and it's not always going to feel like it's truly there. There's another magnificent definition of love. Um, I think from M. Scott Peck, that love is extending yourself for the per for the benefit of another, right? And that's actually, that's, and then there's the like feelings of love, the warmth of love, the experience of beauty and connection and intimacy. Sometimes love makes you cry with sadness because love is part of grief, you know? So to show up in the world that way and to, and to, to embody the fierceness of love, which, which transcends the greeting card version of love or the superficial version of love and says that love sometimes actually means laying down your life for the sake of another, being more willing to die than to kill. Love love is what drives the kind of people who I'm in awe of who go out and clear landmines, you know? People who clear landmines so that other people won't step on them and be blown to bits, which means they're risking that they will step on them and be blown to bits. That's a fierce kind of love. It's not a weak love or the love. I mean, you know, the landmine clearing thing is kind of a spectacular, dramatic thing. The, 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 the love from a parent, usually someone who would be conventionally defined as a, as, as a mother. It's usually a, a, a mother with this would show up who is willing to forego her own uh, needs in order to care for the vulnerable children in her life, you know, or to feed like not have as much to eat so that they can have enough uh, to eat and to do that day in, day out, day in, day out. Not that every mother is in, in poverty in that way, but, you know, every mother that I know, every sane and healthy, well mother that I know has put her children first. Many of the fathers too. It just, I'm, I'm simply using that as an example because the the kind of physical courage of the landmine theory or landmine clearing tends to be associated with men and that's sexism, right? Because there's loads of people who are not men who go and clear landmines and there's loads of people who are not women who are nurturing parents. I'm simply using the archetypes in our yeah. society to say love is not weakness, right? Love is actually courage mm -hmm. and it deserves a place at the table of political discourse. So absolutely right. Send love to Trump. And if you're a Trump supporter, send love to me. Right. Because I am worthy of it. <laughs> it's all love. I don't it's hate you. Love. I don't hate oh, you. Yeah. But I want to care for vulnerable people first. And I think if we can if that we that sort of, that has got to find its way into our discourse. Right. Again, you know. I feel that if every conversation, whether in that has created a vision in our world today can start with two people sitting in front of each other and just saying, I love you. I don't understand you. Mm. I don't judge you. I just love you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even for you, my, my brother is gay and I I've lived mm. intimately through tremendous amount of trauma in in the 80s in South Africa, um, when it was not just racism, it was insane homophobia. And mm -hmm. um, to to live with that through uh, through his eyes and through my love for him mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. can, can you just go to somebody mm -hmm. that you don't understand that and mm -hmm. say to him, hey, you're a human being, I love mm -hmm. you. <laughs> I, I don't understand how the way your brain works, but that's okay. I still mm -hmm. love you, accept you. Can we not just change the world through that? Amen oh, to that. You know, Marina, I think about Shane Claiborne, right? I don't know, Gareth, right. if you know him. Right. But mm -hmm, um, I do. yeah, Shane Claiborne. And we interviewed him too. And yes. um, what an amazing man, right? Mm -hmm. He came from such a He's such a, you know, the typical 
evangelical Christian background, and then uh, went to India and saw what was going on there and experienced, you know, Mother Teresa, and yeah. then came back and decided he was going to make a difference from the grassroots, from the grassroots to live on the same street where so much, um, you know, who in their right mind, right? The, the quotes, who in their right mind would live in that area of Philadelphia? Mm -hmm. And yet that was his choice. Um, mm -hmm. And that I think that's what we're talking about here. It's It's my street. This is my street. So how do I make a difference on my street? Because I don't know what's going on in that house, but love your neighbor as yourself and across the street or whatever. So it doesn't really matter our political views. They're my neighbor. Or it doesn't matter what religion I am. You're my neighbor. So I think that's like you're saying, the mother and her children or the father and his children just everybody is us everybody is on every this is my street <laughs> you're my person doesn't matter doesn't matter what you're whatever that fill in the blank you know it's always like mm -hmm. i am a blank fill in the blank mm -hmm. well i'm a human are you a human yeah hey welcome to earth <laughs> so you know like i mean maybe i was born just mm -hmm. a little bit just a little bit different than most people, but I'm glad that there's other people just born a little bit different too, like mm. Marina and you. <laughs> so the so last thing- we are pretty much running out of time here. Mm. Um, Gareth, how can people get hold of you and get hold of your books? Well, they can they can get, uh, books are available uh, wherever books are sold. Um, How Not To Be Afraid and A Whole Life in 12 Movies also have one. Uh, called uh, Corey and the Seventh Story that I co-authored with Brian McLaren and, the, and A Whole Life in 12 Movies co-authored with Kathleen Norris. And the best way to to find me and, and the kind of work we do in community is to go to theporchcommunity.net, theporchcommunity.net. And then I have my own website at garethhiggins.net. Glad to, glad to help if I can. Is there going to be a porch gathering? Uh, there will be a porch gathering in uh, Asheville, North Carolina, or in the outskirts of Asheville in March 2025. And um, if you sign up for updates at theporchcommunity.net, then you'll get announcements. We're, we're going to make them in the next week or so. And uh, you can find more information on the porch gathering at theporchgathering.com. I know that's a lot of websites. So the best, the best place dates. to find it all is theporchcommunity.net. Okay. Do you have some dates already? Because I'm I'm thinking of heading down that direction. Oh yeah, look, uh, looking forward to to having to having you with us. So yes, registration will be available by by mid November. I hope. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, Gareth. This was absolutely wonderful. Thank for sharing your heart, your vision, your love, your image of God with us. It was beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And, it's been uh, a pleasure again. Uh, wishing you both all good things. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our audience for listening, for watching. And we trust that this conversation brought you lots of hope today. It sure did for me. And we will be back next week with more hope. And if you like what we do, please subscribe. And we will see you next time. Thank you.